I'm Stacey Marie Ishmael, Managing Editor of Crypto for Bloomberg News. And this is Bloomberg Crypto, a daily Bloomberg iHeart podcast. It's Friday, August 12th. Bloomberg Crypto Senior Editors Dave Litka and Anna Herrera join me this week for another edition of what we're calling Friday in the Editor's Room. That's when you'll hear from me and a couple of our other crypto editors on the highs and lows of this week. We'll talk about the biggest stories that we're covering and what's driving markets right now. Anna, Dave, thank you both for being here. Yes, Dave. Anna, you are in Italy at the moment. I am. We're fully embracing that distributed crypto lifestyle. <laughs> we are. I am a crypto nomad, sort of, for, for, the, for the month. A crypto nomad for the month. Um, stay tuned for more reporting on that to our listeners. But Dave, one of the stories that we've been really paying attention to, obviously for a long time, but especially this week, is Coinbase's most recent earnings results. Can you just talk through a little bit about what that was, why people have been paying attention, and like what the market reaction has been like. Sure. Coinbase, for those who don't know or do know, it's the um, biggest U.S. publicly traded exchange and also what, probably one of the biggest and most influential players in crypto right now. There's over 100 million people who are signed up for this on it. They're as good as barometers anything you're going to see. And everybody knew it was a bad quarter on it, but they actually had a more than $1 billion swing in revenue. So a year ago when everybody was all excited about a crypto, they made over $2 billion in revenue. This year they were less than a billion on it, which in any industry you never see swings like that. Right. So it was really indicative of what's going on. And of course with all these calls, um, people want to know what's going on, what's going to happen next on it. And they, they did flick, said it's we're crypto winner. We're not going to make any predictions in terms of when it's over, but we think it's going to be slow going forward. So as you say, a billion dollars is a fairly dramatic move by any conceivable metric. What contributed to that weakness specifically? Were they making less money on a particular part of the business? Well, they make their money through fees on mm -hmm. it. I mean, that's why Wall Street loves them. There's a model there on it. But when everybody who got into crypto decides not to trade anymore and sits on their hands and then become hodlers, as they call um, rather than traders or speculators or the, the FOMO fear tapers out, then they don't generate fees. So mm -hmm. That was the biggest impact. So their biggest problem is people were like, I'm just going to wait and see and not, not making any transactions at all. And they need they need that transaction volume to make money. Yep. Transactions, how they make their business. And the, the big question is with all these um, exchanges is when does retail come back? Mm hmm. What did they say about their NFT business? Because they recently launched a, a platform for non-fungible tokens and they were like, we're going to compete with the biggest players and we're going to do it through user experience. Like, how's that been going? It was probably one of the worst time launches ever <laughs> in terms of a product as the market was collapsing. But they did say in the call, hey, we're in for the long haul on this. What else would you expect them to say on it? They're not going to punt on what a lot of people think is kind of the future of mm -hmm. this sector. They're holding the course, as it were, on their NFTs. They're not pulling back. Correct. Anna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch to you for a slightly different element of the market. You know, people have been really paying attention to Coinbase as, you know, to use one of Dave's words, a barometer of the biggest, most important, most liquid parts of crypto to really understand retail trader sentiment. But then there's like, shall we describe it as a more esoteric part of crypto markets, that universe of what are called mixers, which, you know, services, protocols that people use to obscure the origins and the destinations of, you know, certain types of crypto transactions. What's been going on in mixer land? So there was a, a big week for mixer lands. The U.S. Treasury Department sanctioned a big mixer called Tornado Cash which, as you said, is, is a service that lets you hide your transaction. So if you hack someone's Bitcoin, no one can follow and see where you're sending them. It's been used to launder funds. Tornado Cash. Have you heard of it? I would put this sort of in the category of the most important crypto-related sanctions that ever came out of the U.S. Treasury Department. So obviously, it's a big deal if a crypto service gets sanctioned and blocked because the idea of, of crypto is that it's 
permissionless and, you know, uncensorship resistant. So, so it kind of showed that if you want to, then you can censor crypto. This is the first step, right? Because a way that you could go after a crypto service is by sort of targeting the providers of the underlying technology and infrastructure, right? Which might be companies in the US or companies that do have an incentive to follow US rules. So that was the first step. And then this became somewhat interesting was that the way crypto reacted to, the, to this was, well, you can't censor everything, even providers of, of technology. So what we'll do is we'll show you that there's only so far as you can go. Some anonymous users in crypto started using Tornado Cash to send tokens to known wallet addresses. So some of some celebrities and the idea there being we're showing you that then these celebrities could have potentially been implicated in the sanctions or weren't following the, the, the U.S. Treasury's advice or admonishments. Right. It kind of became this giant question and tension in crypto of, you know, is it really censorship, censorship resistance or not? You know, do users have a right to privacy? Don't they? So it became so much more than just, you know, the sanctions to one mixer. So it sounds like there's a couple of issues all tied up in there at once that I want to unpack with you a little bit. I want to start with the privacy question because, you know, in when the Treasury came out and said, hey, you're in trouble, we're going to sanction you. As you say, the very first thing that people said was like, you can't sanction software. And the Treasury was like, watch us. <laughs> we're totally going to sanction software. But immediately after that was this question of how does that work in practice. And so one of the things that we saw is that Tornado Cash's website, email, um, their access to a platform called GitHub, which is what, you know, developers and people who build software use to share and store their code, they lost access to all of those things. So it looks like the way that you sanction software in crypto is by going to companies that are in like web two world um, and you kind of undermine that decentralization. But the other element of this like privacy question is, OK, if they can go after something that's used, yes, it's used by North Korean hackers, but it's also just used by ordinary people. What does that mean for your ability in crypto to actually maintain some degree of anonymity? And what I'm hearing from you is it's very confusing right now. Yes. And also and also while you might think, well, we do want a society where, you know, some people might want this want a society where people where governments can go after, you know, criminals. You know, we could also think about the reverse idea, right, where, you know, maybe I want to send money to Ukraine or someone in Russia wants to send money to Ukraine and they don't want their government to censor that. Right. There's a legitimate reason why you don't want people to see your transactions. And, and it's especially important if we think about crypto, maybe growing beyond just crypto. Right. If we think about digital assets and government backed central currencies, if crypto does become more of a form of payment, these questions are, are important because then we're talking about anti-money laundering at a much bigger scale. Right. Not just involving you know, transactions that from, from hacking of crypto services, right? It becomes everything. It becomes like I bought a sandwich for lunch and now the government knows about it. Exactly. I appreciate the analogy that you're using there about, you know, because people have wanted to send money to Ukraine. <laughs> and if you are a person in Russia, that's definitely not something that you necessarily want the Secret Service knocking on your door about. But like more prosaically, it's very similar to the conversations in technology around like encrypted messaging and, you know, various government officials will say, well, you can use encrypted messaging for terrorism. I'm like, yeah, but you could also just use encrypted messaging because you want to talk to your friends and you don't want anybody advertising at you. So these this is, I think, a good example of like issues that affect many parts of tech and many parts of the world really playing out in crypto. But th there's something else that you said around, you know, the idea of people using Tornado Cash to send crypto to people with known public accounts and like the legal gray area there. Can you can you just elaborate on that a little bit more? So the, the idea is that if the sanctions are to be applied, then you're not supposed to receive any funds from Tornado Cash, right? So if someone's sending me, even if I don't want it, sending me funds through Tornado Cash, then potentially am I implicated? Am I violating a U.S. sanction? I mean, just the absurdity of that is is you know, interesting is it's worth contemplating, right? Because it just shows that there's a level of thinking that goes into how we regulate this in the future and how we think about money laundering in a sort of Web.3 world that is kind of something that we really need to think about now before it gets to the stage where we haven't thought about the rules to govern a world like this. And that is possible because of, you know, 
the idea of a public wallet, right? So like one of the people who had Ether, in this case, sent to him through Tornado Cash was Brian Armstrong, CEO of Coinbase that we just talked about. And that's possible because his his wallet address, which is like your bank account for crypto, is just like available on the internet. You're like, that's Brian Armstrong's wallet address or one of them. Most people in other parts of their lives like aren't walking around and adver- advertising their bank accounts. So it's very hard to imagine a scenario in which, you know, a person in Iran or Cuba or, you know, North Korea could just like send you money <laughs> or send you something with no ability with no consent or your ability to even know that that's happening and there's you know i think as you say anna like the important thing is there are some of these nuances in crypto that will really be forcing regulators to have to think differently and especially lawyers to have to think differently about these things one thing i want to note is if it is the case like if for some reason one of the people who did receive that, you know, anonymously sent crypto via Tornado Cash were held to be in breach of sanctions, right? So take a theoretical example. The Treasury is like, haha, you person have been interacting with something on the sanctions list. The consequences for them would be not at all fun because what could happen is that wallet could get frozen. So any, you know, not just the amount that they received, but any of their crypto in that wallet could get frozen. They could get kicked off of any exchanges or even, you know, non-exchanges or like banks that they might be a part of. You know, being a sanctioned individual, being a person on a sanctions list is a pretty stiff and severe penalty. Um, So we will definitely be keeping an eye on if anybody gets pulled into this dragnet unawares. Yeah, it's interesting because it was basically crypto trolling sort of the, the U.S. government, but in a way creating some lines to think about that go beyond the actual events of what happened. We'll be right back with a look at some of the crypto trends we're watching this week. You'll keep hearing from Bloomberg editors Dave Litka and Anna Herrera. Well, Dave, I want to go back to you on that point of who's making money right now. One of the things we saw this week in crypto was kind of like a run up in Ether prices. And we've talked on this podcast about, you know, the dynamics of Ether and that folks are thinking about what's called the merge. But as it seems to actually be happening now, can you just give us a recap on what we're seeing and why? Sure. I mean, all you hear probably the next month is going to be the merge, the merge on it. You have uh, this software upgrade where the Ethereum network goes from very energy intensive process to validate transactions to where they'll go to something called validators on it. And everybody is seizing on this right now. Um, You mentioned Brian Armstrong. He actually mentioned a product that they're offering. It's called staking Mm -hmm. on Coinbase on it. And Staking is basically how you make money off this as a, as a validator on it. You allow your Ethereum to be used in the process to complete the transaction on it. And it's, in this environment, it's actually kind of the perfect thing in the sense that it's like passive income on it, especially with a – we're in a bear market like this. So this is almost like clipping coupons in the old uh, days of the bond market on it instead of everybody just looking for huge appreciation in the the price of a various uh, token on it. So you could be hearing more and more of it. And and the risk is it happens, it goes smooth, and then it's, okay, what next? Mm -hmm. Well, what is next? That is to be seen on it. Uh, I guess the, the big question really beyond that is to see if more people do gravitate towards Ethereum. Ethereum was kind of introduced as probably the second most prominent crypto after Bitcoin Mm -hmm. on it. And it was basically labeled as Bitcoin 2.0. You can actually do a lot more with it, complete um, transactions over it that include embedded contracts, that type of thing on it. Bitcoin has basically been left as really a store value of these days and hasn't really worked, obviously, as a currency. But this is being promoted as a utility and whether people will actually start to use it for more things is is to be seen. 
When we talk about the utility of things like Ethereum, the Ethereum, the blockchain, Ether, the token, one of the use cases that comes up a lot is like smart contracts, NFTs. You know, it's it's you know, one one thing we've said here is that like if somebody's heard of crypto, they've probably heard of either Bitcoin or an NFT. And there are there's a lot of reporting and evidence that for some people like NFTs were their gateway into into crypto. If this merge happens, what's going to happen to NFT holders? Like, is it clear whether your NFT will continue to be accessible if you now kind of have two different sorts of blockchains? Are those some of the questions that people are working through? Well, it seems to be we've actually had a lot of uh, news come out recently from people who are basically uh, things like stable coins, which serve as kind of the lifeblood of the industry saying we're going to work with Ethereum on the upgrade mm-hmm. on it. We'll continue to do our transactions there. So you should be fine. Now, there's a minority of people who say, we like how things are being done. We're going to break off from Ethereum. And um, then it becomes a question, okay, if if you're on that chain, are you going to be able to interact with other folks? It, it just raises a, whole, raises a whole level of complication. Right. It's it, So it's almost like you'll have Kind of what happened with Terra and Luna, right? This idea, and actually with Ethereum before, <laughs> we there's already an existing chain of Ethereum called Ethereum Classic. So now we'll have Ethereum Classic, Ethereum Classic Two, <laughs> and, then, yep. and then Ethereum the, Now. There's Bitcoin. There's Bitcoin Cash. There's Bitcoin Classic. There's been various Bitcoin Golds. There's been other ones talked about over the years. It's it's a little bit like a a divorce and uh, <laughs> among programmers. Uh, after the disagreement, um, some succeed and live on; other ones die out. Well, this this is definitely something that is driving the markets, and we will continue to be paying attention to. So, stay tuned for more on that. Um, Anna, Dave, I know we have to get back to work, so we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up. But thank you both for taking the time today. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. You can find all of our work on the Bloomberg Terminal, on Bloomberg.com, and on Twitter. You'll find Anna at at Anna Herrera. That's I-R-R-E-R-A. And Dave is at D Litka. That's D-L-I-E-D-T-K-A. On the next episode of Bloomberg Crypto, in late spring of 2021, after China banned all Bitcoin mining, many Chinese miners headed to the sunny state of Texas with a unique power grid, relatively attractive energy prices, and a relaxed approach to regulation. Texas seemed like it was the place to be. In 2022, things are looking a little bit different. A combination of power outages, extreme temperatures, and declining Bitcoin prices are making it harder and harder for crypto miners to maintain their profitability. To better understand what all of this means, I'll be joined by Bloomberg reporter David Pan and by Ethan Vera, who is the COO and co-founder of Luxor Technology. This is Bloomberg Crypto, a daily podcast from Bloomberg and iHeartRadio. For more shows from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Send us your comments, questions, or suggestions for the show to crypto at Bloomberg.net. Or find us on Twitter, we're at crypto. The supervising producer of Bloomberg Crypto is Vicky Vergalina. Our senior producer is Janet Babin. Our producer is Sharon Barrero. Associate producer is Ty Butler. Desta Wonderad is our engineer. Original music by Leo Sidrin. I'm Stacey Marie Ishmael. Have a great weekend. <laughs>